I recently learned a new term called positive psychology, which essentially studies the positive influences and events in our life. So for decades, psychology has mostly just focused on treatment. Positive psychology, which has really just come around in the last 20 years, looks at prevention, essentially trying to expand on the good and not just treat the bad. This is sort of like a newer domain. It came around like around the 2000s, um, and it was re really spearheaded by this guy named Martin Siegel Siegelman. He wrote the book Authentic Happiness, which I highly suggest you consider reading if anything in this video sparks your interest at all. So positive psychology is most often defined as the study of what makes life worth living. And it really focuses on how using the power of shifting your perspective can maximize your happiness. Anyways, the whole thing goes on to prove that we actually do have some control over our level of happiness and just making some small shifts in our perspective or in the way that we live our life can actually benefit us by making us generally more happy. Now, obviously as human beings, like we all get down, we have like bad days, we get into ruts, we have really hard years. Nobody is a level 10 happy all of the time. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I find personally my happiness tends to ebb and flow. Um, and lots of times it can be impacted by the events that are going on in my life. Lots of times events that I have no control over. But that being said, there are a lot of things also in my control that I can do to raise my general happiness and decrease stressors. And so I thought that I would sort of share some little things that I have found, some like simple tweaks that I have found that I can make in my life that generally help me feel better, feel in a better mood, and raise my general daily happiness. Okay, number one is to be kind to others, to perform random acts of kindness. And it may at first seem a little counterproductive to like perform acts of kindness to somebody when you are the one feeling like you need the kindness. But science has actually proven that performing random acts of kindness actually boosts your own happiness. One study I read about that he actually talks about in that book, Authentic Happiness, um, had a bunch of students perform things that they consider pleasurable and then perform things where they're providing some type of service. So an example of something that might be pleasurable would be like watching Netflix or eating a Sunday and then providing service might be, you know, tutoring a student or, um, you know, helping your neighbor mow their lawn or whatever. And they had to write about their experience doing these different things and ultimately found that people felt genuinely happier and like better people. And they thought people perceived them better all when they performed you know, acts of service and kindness. It made them feel better to do kind things for others. Where the other things that were pleasurable that you would consider maybe would make you feel better actually didn't provide them a real level of happiness. Another study found that people who volunteer tend to have better life satisfaction. And then another study where it studied people spending money, it found that when somebody spent money on somebody else, the person who spent the money actually received more happiness than the receiver of the gift. So in short, just by being nicer and by being kinder to other people, People, you're actually being nicer and kinder to yourself because it's raising your own level of happiness. So a really simple way to just feel generally happier every day is to find a little way to be kinder to other people around you in your everyday life. Okay, number two is to declutter. In general, the clutter in our home is not really doing us any good deed. I have read a monstrous amount of studies around mental health, health and clutter, and clutter really impacts our mental health in a really um, big way. And so it makes sense to me because I know personally, as I have become a less cluttered and more organized person, my mental health has also increased and gotten better. One study I've seen referenced over and over and over again in sort of the field about clutter and the negative impacts of clutter is a study that they did um, on men and women who viewed their homes as cluttered, which total side note, but it has been proven that women tend to be bothered by clutter more. But basically what it did is it found that women who described their home as cluttered or as disorganized had higher cortisol levels than women who did not describe their homes this way. If you don't know, cortisol is the stress hormone. And even more interesting, 
the women who described their homes as cluttered and had higher cortisol even had a spike of cortisol at the end of the day when your body usually naturally is decreasing its cortisol. So anyways, our brains are sort of wired to like some order. And so when uh, visually a place is very disorganized and cluttered, it tends to drain our brain of its cognitive like resources and thus this reduces your focus. So not only is clutter leading to stress and impacting your general well-being, which obviously is going to um, impact your overall happiness in life, it's also impacting your productivity and your focus. Number three is to focus on spending less. If you're like pretty much anybody in the history of, of ever, you have had a moment where you're like a treat yourself moment, right? You deserve you know, this fancy coffee or you got a raise and you're gonna get a nice pair of shoes or whatever. And certainly some retail therapy, in my opinion, is not bad. Most like small cases of retail therapy might work, but when you start using shopping as a cure for happiness in order to make yourself more happiness, to make yourself more happiness, to make yourself happier, that's where it becomes a problem and science actually says it doesn't work. Retail therapy is not going to make you happier. When you purchase something, you get a very small ru rush of dopamine. That's that like happy hormone, but it doesn't stick around and it doesn't last. I was reading a study recently where neuroscientists studied a bunch of monkeys and the setup was that the monkeys had to press a bar f uh, 10 times. And when they pressed it on the 10th time, they would get a treat. Once the monkeys were conditioned to this, they knew they pressed it 10 times and they would get the treat. So they started um, studying the dopamine release in their brain and found that as they were pressing the bar, the dopamine was increasing in their brain. But by the time they got to the 10th press and they actually received the treat, the dopamine had crashed and they weren't receiving dopamine anymore. So it was actually the anticipation of receiving the reward that gave them the dopamine and not the actual item. And I think a lot of us can relate to this, especially when it comes to online shopping. Lots of us will use online shopping. We're sort of like, we're bored or we want a little pick me up. And so we'll go online to do a little bit of shopping. But the reason that it feels good and we like come back to it thinking it's going to give us happiness is it's the actual anticipation of getting something, of searching for it. You place the order. Now you have to wait for the item to come. And by the time the item actually comes and you open the box, you're not actually getting any gratification from it. Now, like I said, using retail therapy on occasion is not a bad thing. It's more when it becomes a crutch um, in the sense that you're using it constantly to try to like fill, fill a void or like feel happier. Cause not only does science say that doesn't work, it actually has proven that people who save more and are more like financially responsible, if you will, who are spending less, are actually happier. There was one study where they studied a whole bunch of participants and they asked them questions about their materialism, their financial habits, and then their general well being and um, sort of like mental health. And it basically found a direct correlation between the people who spent less were generally happier, they had generally like better well-being, where the people who were more materialistic um, tended to be less happy and were more likely to have signs of depression. One of the researchers in the study was quoted saying that people who save money report better overall well-being, including less psychological distress, and people who buy less and consume less show less depressive symptoms. Now I can tell you from personal experience that I am a far happier person since we got control of our own finances and went through the hard process of paying off debt. And while certainly I can still get caught up in a moment of retail therapy, um, I have learned that it's really not going to give me like any level of satisfaction or happiness that I used to think that I was getting from it. Ultimately, the point is, while some retail therapy is fine, it's actually found that it's not going to make you happier and actually spending less is going to make you feel better. And it's never obviously worth it when it's at the expense of your own financial goals. Now, today's video is actually sponsored by Truebill, who I've told you about before, and they are the perfect partner for you if you're trying to um, live a more financially secure life and get like better control over your finances. Truebill essentially is an app that was designed to help everyday people get control of their finances. It is a financial platform that is designed to help you spend less and save more. And it does this a couple of different ways. One way is the app 
easily sets up budgets for you that will automatically monitor your spending by category. I love this one for combating any retail therapy because you can set caps um, for what you want to spend in different categories and that acts as like a really great motivator for you when you want to go and spend on something and you could say wait 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 this is gonna like over go you know my cap for what I wanted to spend on this it'll even send you little notifications if you're about to go over or if you go over on a certain category that you set. Truebill can also help you save money using their smart savings account you choose the amount and frequency and Truebill will automatically deposit into your savings account for you and it even even helps you identify any subscriptions that you use so you can just easily cancel any subscriptions that you're not currently using. Overall, it's just a really easy, like all in one platform to help you keep control of your finances. And I feel like really empower you to um, stay on top of it. Anyways, if you wanna try, you can try it totally for free by going to my link, which is truebill.com forward slash buffers coffee, or you can just click the link in the description box down below. All right, number four is to detox your social media. This is something that I've talked about a lot, but I think that it's really, really important. I like a lot of things, social media is one of those things that it can be amazing. You know, I think lots of times people like to talk about like the negative effects of social media, and certainly there are some, but I think social media does really amazing things too. I think it helps connect us to people. It helps us have a voice. It can help us feel less alone. I know there have been moments in my own life when social media has really acted as a lifeline to other people. Like when I was like in the thick of it when, with newborn life and it helped me connect with other mothers and other people like in that newborn lifetime. But at the same time, social media also gives you uh, sort of, you know, as pe everyone talks about like the highlight reel, but it also, I feel like people who are on your feed are now getting direct access into your mind. Like who's showing up on your feed is now getting into your brain and what they say, you're allowing them real estate inside your brain and so i'm always a big believer in detoxing your social media feed i do it a ton myself um it's about choosing who you want to show up on your feed because the people whether you like it or not the people who show up on your feed are going to be impacting your brain and your mood um if there's somebody who shows up on your feed and they're constantly sharing stuff that you find negative or that bothers you or makes you feel down, like that's impacting you, but you have that choice of them showing up on your feed. So I'm always a big believer in going through your feed and deleting people. When these people show up, we all know them, the people who show up on your feed and they just bring you down. You know, as you're scrolling your feed, take note of the people who seem to be impacting you not in a positive way. If they're on your feed, if you're allowing them into your life, they should be impacting you positively, right? They should be making you feel happier. The people who are draining your happiness, remove them from your feed, unfollow them, like let them go from your life. There's so many reasons we follow people for different reasons. And then we just kind of end up still following them and letting them come into our lives and into our brains. And then the trick I always share with you guys every single time I talk about detoxing social media, if it's somebody who you are following because they're a coworker or they're like a friend of a friend and it would be weird to unfollow them, you can block, um, I mean not block, you can mute pretty much anybody. Um, you go on Instagram, you go to their profile, you click the following button and an option will come down to either unfollow, block, or mute. And you can mute these people. So now you're still following them, but none of their stuff is gonna show up on your feed. I'm telling you, this makes a huge impact to me. I really focus on following like a lot of really um, inspiring accounts, motivating accounts, accounts that are about happiness and like whatever. And I know that directly impacts my day-to-day -day happiness because I'm following happiness and it's making me feel happier. All right, next up, I think we're on like five or six. I'm not sure, I lost count. But the next one is gratitude journaling. Um, not necessarily that it has to be gratitude journaling, we'll get to that in a minute, but there have been a lot of studies about, and we're getting back to the science and the studies. I know you're like, how many studies have you read, Callie? A lot. There are a lot of studies that connect gratitude with happiness. Research has shown that appreciating what we have in life brings life satisfaction and positivity. And it has also connected counting our blessings to being more content and having a lower chance of experiencing depression. There was even a study done at UCLA that um, researched the effects of gratitude and actually found that by like counting your blessings, by being grateful, it actually changes the molecular structure of your brain and it allows 
gray matter in your brain to function more properly thus making you overall more happy and more healthy. I feel like for a while there was a lot of information about how negative thoughts, how being, uh, you know, having anxiety and depression, how it can affect our like physical bodies. Um, there's been a lot of studies around that, right? How stress can cause heart disease and how anxiety can cause, you know, other issues. Um, and I think that now we're starting to realize that if negative thoughts and feelings can impact our bodies in a negative way, positive thoughts and actions can affect our body in positive ways. And I love this study because I feel like it literally proves that and it shows it in such a like clear way. Now, obviously in order to get the benefits of gratitude, you have to like legitimately feel grateful. You can't just like fake it. You know, you have to like have general real gratitude. Um, and so that's why I love the idea of gratitude journaling. So let me show you how that generally works. So how do you gratitude journal? There isn't necessarily a wrong way to do it, but just doing it through the most of writing down things you're thankful for probably isn't going to give you the benefits you want. Typically the best way to do it is to get specific. To focus on details is really helpful. So not just saying I'm grateful for my kids, but saying maybe I'm thankful for the long walk I took with my kids today in the nice weather. Most studies show gratitude journaling one time a week is most effective, and there's lots of apps and prompts that you can use to get started, but at the end of the day, just intentionally practicing gratitude is the first step. All right, my next tip is to seek out fulfillment and purpose, which I feel like sounds <clears throat> really abstract, but I'm going to explain it in a really basic way. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book Authentic Happiness that I talked to you at the beginning was when he talks about the difference between gratification and pleasure. Both bring us some level of happiness, but the difference is essentially pleasure is easy while gratification requires some work that you do it. So pleasure may be eating an ice cream sundae, uh, going out to have a, a fancy meal at a restaurant. Uh, these are all pleasurable things and they can make you feel better, but they don't uh, give you long lasting effects. Where gratification is something that requires some work on your end. So this would be going for a hike or harvesting vegetables from your own garden. Uh, this requires a little bit of work, but the actual benefits that you get from it are far more long lasting. Um, it's actually been proven that uh, doing things that give you gratification help combat things like depression and anxiety and all of that. Um, but the thing that's interesting about gratification versus pleasure is pleasure is easy to choose. It's easy to say, sure, I'll meet you out for a glass of wine. Or yeah, you know, it's been a long day, I'm gonna sit down and just like put on, you know, some boring documentary which nothing wrong with boring documentaries, I like watching them too, but they're easy choices. Where things that give us gratification um, tend to, you know, you kind of have to make the choice to put in a little bit of work to do it. Uh, it's a little harder to say like, okay, I'm gonna drag myself outside to work on the garden or whatever. And I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, I always talk about with my husband, that things that provide us some feeling of fulfillment or purpose, um, is really a huge component to feeling happier in life. There's actually a book that I read recently called Ikigai, which is the Japanese secret to a long, happy life. And it looks at, there's this like community in Japan where the people like live much longer than the rest of the world. And so they look at like what it is about these people. And obviously there's a lot about, um, you know, their health and what they eat and stuff, but a very big component about it is that they focus very much on purpose, that these people have a purpose in life, um, whether the purpose is derived from their work or from something like a hobby that they do outside of work. And it even goes as far as say, you know, the people who, who get the feeling of purpose from their job, when they like retire, they still continue to go and do the work. Like they'll go to the work and maybe they're, you know, being an apprentice or they're still going in a few days a week to like do something because it's giving that, that feeling of purpose and fulfillment and such an important part of our life, of living a happy life. If you really think about, you know, what are the things that give you the most happiness and gratification, it's usually the things that you had to work for a little bit. So while I very abstractly said, you know, search out things that give you purpose and meaning, which is very abstract, in general, it just means sometimes make the choice to do something that's maybe a little bit more hard work, but that's going to give you a stronger feeling of fulfillment at the end. Um, really seek out moments and things that are going to give you purpose and fulfillment. My last and final one is just to make sure to like get some, some fresh air and some sunshine 
every day. There have been actually also studies about people who get fresh air and the benefits that it has on them. Um, I feel like I'm just throwing books at you, but the book um, Last Child in the Woods um, talks about the importance of nature to our overall well-being and there's actually been studies of people in the ICU um, who have a view of the outside and have a view of nature versus those who don't and they tend to recover at a much faster rate and have a higher rate of like um, success as far as like getting better. So I didn't prep a lot of research about this one, but I feel like I just have to throw it in. Um, when you are having a bad day, when you need some happiness, generally you can get it from the outside. You can get it from sun, open your window, get fresh air, go out in the backyard, take off your shoes, put your feet in the grass. There is amazing um, health and mental benefits to the outdoors. All right, my friends, that does it. That is the end of this video. Again, thank you to Truebill for sponsoring today's video. You can take, um, you can go to truebill.com forward slash about first coffee to try it out for free. As always, I appreciate you so much stopping by and watching. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Remember to be kind to yourself and others, and I will see you all in my next video.